Hi, welcome to Go On The Run. And today is looking at binary encoding. Now, if you look, I kicked off Go On The Run by doing some text encoding by showing you how to encode data with JSON, XML, and comma separated values. But now I wanna to switch to using binary encoding. So these are the formats, XML, JSON, comma separate values, are gonna be good or required when you do not have control how the data is generated or consumed. But if you're the one writing the server or client or the services, when we get to microservices, then you might want to consider using something like binary encoding. So we're gonna kick off a next set of videos by starting with binary encoding, then once we play around with binary encoding, then we're gonna look at gRPC, how to do remote procedure calls using gRPC. Remote procedure call is a very generic thing. Just how do you call some procedure that's being exposed remotely by a service? And gRPC is a specific protocol that describes how you can do remote procedure call. Then we'll look at Docker containers and how we can use that to our benefit to get up and running quickly or to put our application inside of Docker containers. And then we're going to play with microservices and then sort of tie in all the things that we've done in the previous section, which is binary encoding, gRPC, containers. We're gonna use the idea of migrating microservices and deploying them in Docker containers and those services are gonna be talking or expose their service over gRPC and of course use binary encoding because these are services that we control. If you look, we will see in our binary encoding directory is empty, but instead of changing to that directory and starting Visual Studio Code there like I usually do, I'm gonna start Visual Studio Code in the directory that we're currently in. And the reason for that is I wanna have access to some of our older code. So this is where we started, this directory is empty. So I'll create a new folder here, I'll call it part one. And of course, I like breaking things up and some of you seem to like, oh, I slowly evolve the examples. So we're gonna start with exercise one also. All right, so right now we don't have anything. And so let me just go grab some code for us to work with. So what should I start with? Well, if you think about what we were doing in the resource pool, we pretended that we had a client and a server, and we were sending these client request messages from the client to the server, and the server would consume it and work on the message. And so I figure, why not go back there and grab our model from this directory? So I'll just copy the model alone for now, and I'll paste that in our example one directory. And so if you remember, this is our client request model. I'm not going to change it in any way whatsoever. Now in this directory, I'd like to have a, a module. So I'll create a go.mod file and the module name I'll give it is simply binary encoding because that's what we're working on. So simple short name, um, that seems like it's gonna work. So I'll close this file, get rid of that. Now I know that all this look a little bit confusing with all of this going on. So if you find this too confusing, then simply uh, quit your Visual Studio Code and then start the Visual Studio Code editor on that directory alone. So that way, if you find that oh, having all those different subdirectories open a little bit confusing, this is probably a little bit more um, seen to look at. All right, so what is the next thing I wanna do? Well, inside our example one directory, I like to have a main.go file. So main.go. And so I'll do func main. And with my editor, I'll set up when I click save, it automatically um, puts in package main there for me. So that's fine. So it looked like if we're ready to go, except my main is in my part one directory and I want it to be in my example one directory. So. There we go, so now that's better. All right, so what do we want to encode? Well, let's sort of look at why we might want to do binary encoding. And to get a feel for that, I figure we do a simple example to look at how much data we're sending to our server when we include it as JSON. Now, 
it doesn't really matter if we use JSON or XML. Those are sort of um, almost human readable format. So they're not going to be as efficient as binary. So we could sort of play with what the size look like when we encode a client request. So let's do that. So let's say we want to pretend that we want to send a message to the server and we're going to encode it. Okay, so there's our message. And we know from before, if you want to encode something, then you have to have an appropriate encoder. So let's use, let's start off with an XML encoder, for example. And for XML encoder, we need some way to write that data. So we need a IO writer. And so for this example, instead of creating like a file, I'll simply use a bytes buffer. All right, so what is this complaint about? Declared and not used. And that is because before I print out the size of the buffer, let me encode something into that buffer. And so we're going to encode our message to the server. Okay, so there we go. So we have a message and we are going to encode it to the server and we want to print out how big that how much data do we put in that buffer so let's go to our command line now i don't know if we're going to be able to run this from here let's see nope that doesn't work from there so let's go to our command line terminal and we in part one exercise one we'll go to the models directory we'll do go build Make sure this build successfully. Go back up one and do go build again. And then if we run our binary encoder, we should see that, our, whoa, look at that. It's using 3,154 bytes to encode our message using XML. Now, does that seem reasonable? Well, the only way we can kind of get an idea is if we look at how big our message is before we send it. And so there are a couple of ways we can do this. We can kind of, since our type is really small, we could kind of calculate and get a rough estimate. It's not going to be exact, but for example, this data field is 1K, which is 1024 bytes. So that's 10,024 bytes. And we're using three ints. We have in size, int request type. So those are going to be four bytes each. And this is unsigned int. So this is also going to be four bytes. So four times three, or three times four rather, is 12. And four times three, same thing. So we have 12 bytes in addition to the 1024 that we're using. And so this should give us 1,036 bytes. That is the size of our data structure. Now there's some padding that might be happening and so on. So we should expect that oh, maybe it's not gonna be exactly that size. And there's a way for us to know what the exact size of this um, data structure is. Um, but I don't think we really need to go look at that. Um, it's called the um, unsafe pack from the unsafe package. We can get, um, we can check that size out. But I don't think we need to do that because we're already seeing that how to encode this thing that is, you know, 1,000 something bytes, it's taking up 3,000 something. It actually encodes it with 3,000 bytes. So if we were to send this message as XML to our server, every one of our message would take up 3,000 bytes. And so that's three times, about three times the size of the data or our data structure or the data we actually want to send, but in order to, to send it, we have to encode it. And that's what's required. Now, maybe you might not like that how um, XML uses 3000 bytes, so you decide to use JSON instead. JSON, if I can type. And so now if we switch to JSON and we rebuild our code, and then we run it, now we can see that how it's as it's like one third or basically from previous value or it's twice as much as we think it should be this is still a lot better than xml right so if you have clients that you're sending data to and you send them this much data um using xml you might want to consider switching to json because you're going to save for every message sent you're going to save them some data and that might be important if they're on a phone for the data bandwidth or just in terms for your server itself and your own network efficiency, sending being able to exchange the same information but using less data is always a good thing. So here is why we wanna try and investigate binary encoding because we wanna see 
how efficient we can get um, data exchange. And so XML was bad, JSON is better, but can we do even better than this? Now, so far, we have to only use encoding formats that we know. So what are the encoding formats are available? So if we jump to our web browser and we go to the Golang package encoding package, we can see that you know it talks about all the different encoding formats and basically define an interface for encoding. And so it goes through all of that. But if you scroll along here, we can see the sub packages. And so there are a number of encoding formats. And so we've tested XML and JSON. Some of these other encoding formats are not good for really exchanging data with your server really. And so we can play around with all of these, but I don't think we really need to do that. And we're not going to, even though I say we use them, do we do binary encoding? We're not going to use this binary package because this one is only specifically for number and byte sequences. And what we have here is a data structure. And so this is not going to work. The binary format from the Go package here encoding is not going to work for our client request message because it does not do structs. But here is a package that might actually work for us. The package gob manages streams of gob, which is binary values exchanged between an encoder, which is a transmitter, and a decoder. And so we can simply switch to gob and see if this is more efficient than our XML and you know um, JSON, which we have tried so far. So switching to gob is also very easy. We can simply see simply say gob, and we save changes, and that's it. And now we're going to build and go build. Why am I keep typing build? And we rerun. And as you can see, XML, JSON, GOB. And when we did the rough calculation of how big our data structure should be, we saw that it came out to about 1,000 and about 34. Now, there seemed to be an extra 100 bytes in there. And I don't know exactly what that's used for, but yes, this is still a lot better than what we were sending before. So I would say immediately, immediately, we see the benefit for binary encoding. We don't exactly know what's and how this is encoded, but we could print it out if we want. It may not make sense, but we could take a look at it. Okay, so this just demonstrates that we could encode something in binary format, but it doesn't tell us that we can actually decode. So let's just copy our example here and paste it back. So in example two, let's switch to example two. Or let's make sure that we're working with example two. And so for example two, we're going to now try to decode this data. So we can say this was us sending the data to the, this is the client side. It's going to create the message, encode it but then we want to send it to the server. So this is our client side, and we're going to pretend somehow that we send this to the server. And we, this is going to be our to-do. And we're not going to worry about exactly how we do that just yet. And then we'll say on the server side, We want to decode the message. So we need a variable into which we decode the message. Now I decided to do this sort of fluent call here just to save us from typing. Now I could have saved the return value of our GOP decoder if I have to decode several messages. But since this is just an example of us decoding one message, um, so I just call immediately on that value that's return the decoder. I call decode and tell it to decode whatever is was sent in this buffer, written into that buffer decode it into our message from client here, which is this new value that we created and have the pointer to. And so now that we have that message decoded, we can then print it out. All right, so let's go to exercise two directory. And again, we'll just do go build. And we'll try to run our binary thing and there we can see we have the message we can see that the size is 1134 just as before 
But once we send it, we receive the exact same message, which we sent, which the ID was one, request type was three, and the size was 256. That's how our message is. And of course, we have to send all the 1024 or 1024 um, zeros because we were using array of bytes. And so we have to send all those bytes, even though they're zero. So that, that's where compression would come in to say, look at repeated bytes and then make it more efficient. But we'll stick with this for now. We're not going to change this. I'll keep going. OK, so now that we know that the gob package allow us to do encoding, binary encoding that's more efficient than XML or JSON, let's see if we can use this with our client and server. So let's go now and copy the example from our last resource pool and use that. So if you remember, we had the resource pool and we have part four was the last part and we have exercise three. So I'll copy that. I'll do, I want to copy everything and I want to do it from the pool part four exercise three. And what I want, where I want to copy this now is to our binary encoding part one and I'll give it the same name, exercise three. So if I come back here, I should see in exercise three and we should have our model and we haven't changed that. So I'm not going to worry about it. So let's close this. So that's fine. We have our resource pool. And so if you remember our resource pool now is using thread pool and model. That is because our package here is called thread pool but let's change this to binary encoding as the package name for these examples. So that means that in our resource pool, we have to change this to binary encoding. So what else do we need to change? Well, in our client main, we don't have to change anything. It doesn't use thread pool. And so the only place is in our submitter, client submitter, it was using the thread pool and so we should say binary encode model. That's the model from this package. Now that we've changed the package directory for our client, let's go build our, we go to exercise three, we go to the model directory, we do go build to build our model, we go back up to the client, and we do go build on the client. So we ensure that our client is successful. Okay, so our client is successfully built, that's good. Now we can move on. So the next thing we want to do is change our pool. So our pool, we also ensure that that's um, properly using the same package, but now we have to build it also. So let's go to the pool, resource pool, and go build that. And the next thing we want to work on is our server. And so for our server in main.go, we can see that we're not using anything from that package, so that's fine. Nothing here. And so here is the only place where we reference thread pool. So we should say binary encoding is what is our package now. And everything else should work just fine. And we should say go build. Okay, oh, we already built this. So server and then go build. And this works fine. So let's test this out, however. So let's start up our server. So we do server and we run it and I'll open a split terminal here and CD into our, go back up to our client directory and run the client. And as we remember from before, our server is going to essentially run for 50 seconds and then that's gonna give our clients the opportunity to connect and send 100,000 messages. I want to change things a little bit. Notice all the stuff I've done so far, I have not changed our code really um, to use binary encoding. We're still using XML, um, JSON encoding. We're still using JSON encoding. Everything I've done so far was basically to just change our module name and the code that references it. I have not modified our code in any way. So it's still using JSON encoding. Okay, so we sent 100,000 messages and we were able to, you know, use our thread pool. So that's great. All right, so here's what I want to do. Instead of trying to run multiple clients, 
and starting the server and having to figure out the timing. What I'll do is I'll have our client continuously send messages and trying to send to the server, have it just sit in a loop trying to send message. And that allows us to, when our server starts up, it can start receiving messages immediately. And then when it shuts down, no big deal. We'll really see how many messages our server process within the time that it was allowed to run because our client is always going to send message. So the way we do that is we go to the client submitter function. Well, actually we go to the client and we go to main. And the only thing I want to do is wrap this in a for loop. So I'll just go forever loop, basically just try forever. If you fail to submit, just keep trying. And so our client will never exit. Now, the other thing is we have to wait 50 seconds for our server to process some message. So since our client is going to be sending continuously and we don't want to waste time, I'd say let's just do 10 seconds for now. And so now let's go do go build. And for our client, we do the same thing, go build. And let's start the client first because we want the client to keep sending messages. Even if it fails, it keep trying to send messages. And that's what's happening there. And then now we can start the server. And so we can say server is going to run for 10 seconds because that's the only thing we've changed. Again, we're still doing JSON. The only difference now is that we don't have this race condition of when we start the server and when we start the client and so on. So we see in this 10 second with our client continuously starting to send message, we were able to send about 60 something thousand messages. So let's try that again. Uh, we start up our server. Remember our client is just running all the time. And let's see how many messages we can get. We're just starting to get a rough idea and we should come in around this again, 60 something thousand messages. All right, good. So let's exit this client now. And so now that we've modified the code, uh, let's move to a different example. So I'll copy I'll paste that back just to make it easy for us to track what kind of changes we're making. Now we know how many messages we can send in 10 seconds using JSON encoding. Now let's change this to use GOB encoding. That is pretty easy. From the client side, we go to the submitter and notice we're using JSON. So we find where we're using JSON to encode our messages. And so that's here. And so we use a new JSON encoder. So we just change this to gob. And we'll just change the name of this to just say encode ENC. All right, no big deal. Uh, we could have just left it the way it was, but hey, why not? And so now this is going to send gob binary messages. Here is something that we have to change. When we post our message, we're saying that all the data we're sending from this buffer is text slash JSON. That gives the server the opportunity to know how it should understand this data. Instead of saying text JSON, we want to say application, which means sort of application specific message, and we want to say binary. Okay. Now, if this is confusing for you, just sort of look up this stuff and you'll see about the uh, content type. This is essentially the property we were setting here is the content type. And I don't want to spend too much time on it. You can sort of um, look it up. And of course, if we're going to send binary encoded data to our server, the server must be able to understand this data too. So we go back to our server here and we use using JSON for decoding. And so we scroll down to where we're doing JSON decoding and we say that oh, we're using GOB as our decoder instead. And that's all we need to do. So it didn't update here. So let me do save again. And so it updated the package. So now let's go to example. We go up a little bit. We have to go to example four directory and we're going to go down to our server and we'll do go build and that should build successfully. We go up to directory and then down to example four and we go to the client directory and we do go build for this client. Remember, all we've changed is switching from JSON to GOB. We've already switched it, fixed it so that uh, we can send as many messages as possible. So again, let's start our client. Our client is going to keep trying to send messages. Let's start our server, which is going to listen for messages for 10, um, 10 seconds. Remember, all we're doing now is sending slightly less data. And so we're doing about 64,000. Not a big whoa, but still remember, if the server is processing the same number of messages and the client is processing the same number of messages, the fact that each message is smaller means that oh, we've saved considerable bandwidth. If you remember for our 
binary encoding our messages our size is about 1134 so we can do some quick math on that and say 60,000 times 1134 and that gives us about 64 megabytes that we we're sending versus when we were doing if we did XML that would be a hundred and eighty eight megabytes and even when we did JSON which was twice, twice as big as the message side we we're doing 128 so that tells us that we've cut the message size in half even if we are not able to send any more messages now this is not surprising really the network wasn't the bottleneck anyway so sending smaller messages help our network overall but it didn't do anything for our application per se because it's not our application was sort of waiting for data because the messages were so big just look in terms of the number of bytes we sent went from 128 megs down to 68 megs so half as much okay so this is where i'd like to end this today um hopefully you see the benefit of doing binary encoding see you in the next video bye have a great day